All right. So thanks so much, Monica, for uh, the kind invitation. And uh, of course, thank you very much to Wake Up Narcolepsy for all that you do for not only uh, people with narcolepsy, but the scientific and clinical community who help um, advocate and uh, better understand narcolepsy. So um, unlike Dr. Murray, I'm not uh, a physician. My patients are furry little mice. I'm what is referred to as a basic scientist. So I'm a professor in the Department of Cell and Systems Biology at the University of Toronto. And my lab is, is interested in trying to understand various fundamental biological questions um, and how those relate to uh, narcolepsy. So today I'm gonna talk to you um, about what I'm calling here, cracking the neural code for cataplexy, which is uh, is is one of the areas of of my basic science uh, program. So why can't I advance my slide here? There we go. Okay. So um, as a basic scientist, I have a whole team of very uh, bright uh, individuals who work with me mostly graduate students and research associate. Here's a sort of a, a little snapshot of a, a few, not all of the folks that are working with me um, at the moment. Um, and the people highlighted in red, Dr. Jimmy Frain and Dr. Zoltan Torrentali, and I might add Zoltan is now um, working with Jazz Pharmaceuticals to help the uh, people with narcolepsy from a uh, uh, a drug treatment uh, perspective. Um, the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is really largely what they've done, but there's a whole range of other folks that I work with who have also contributed, and I'm not going to be talking about their work today. But I'd like to acknowledge and thank them because they're the very bright young minds, and in my view, uh, the future of uh, understanding narcolepsy. So what I want to do today is, is walk you through a ser series of experiments um, that we've done in, in my lab at the University of Toronto focused on understanding one specific part of narcolepsy, which is cataplexy. And Dr. Murray very nicely covered some of the background uh, there. So that, that sets the stage nicely for me. But before I do that, I just want to give you a, a sense of what it is that the, that the science uh, that goes on in my lab and why we do it and how does it actually relate to narcolepsy. So um, again, Dr. Murray nicely set the stage and you heard him speak several times about the relationship between REM sleep and narcolepsy. So what my lab is sort of fundamentally interested in is really understanding how does the brain ge generate healthy REM sleep? So this center uh, um, sort of represents the entire brain. And what we're interested in, in my group, is understanding what parts of the brain turn REM sleep on and what parts of the brain turn REM sleep off. And then how do those parts of the brain communicate with one another so that you can have this smooth transition between various types of sleep and wakefulness and REM sleep. And we're fundamentally interested in understanding what core brain areas and what cells in those areas uh, govern REM sleep. Um, but we're also really interested in trying to understand how do the circuits in the brain or the, the brain cells or networks, how do they generate some of the classic features of REM sleep that Dr. Murray already mentioned? So the rapid eye movements, so the rap rapid eye movements are what defines REM sleep in one area. So your eyes during REM sleep move back and forth. Um, and that was an originally used to um, identify REM sleep. But there's this very curious scenario, and this is what got me involved in the entire um, element of narcolepsy. During REM sleep, your muscles are effectively paralyzed. Another way of saying that from a scientific point of view is atonia, which just means lack of muscle tone. How, how, does, the, how does that happen? 
So how does the brain generate REM sleep and how does it generate these various features of REM sleep? I'm going to focus today mostly on muscle atonia because it's our working idea that the atonia that normally occurs during REM sleep sort of pathologically intrudes into wakefulness and that loss of muscle tone or motor atonia is in fact what causes cataplexy in people with narcolepsy. So by understanding the basic brain areas and the cells in them that control muscle atonia during REM sleep, it's our thought that this might lead us to be better understand um, how cataplexy, which again is simply motor atonia or loss of muscle tone, how that might occur. We also look at this in another sleep disorder, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today because really the goal is, is for me to give you an update on uh, the science behind uh, narcolepsy and specifically today cataplexy. So one of the very motivating people in my life from a scientific perspective was this is this lovely young uh, woman named Shannon. Shannon's um, mother read an article about our research that was in the Toronto Star that was talking about some of our narcolepsy findings. And um, Shannon approached me because she was an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto who has narcolepsy. And so Shannon came to visit my lab because she was really interested in how does a basic scientist study narcolepsy and cataplexy uh, in mice? And so Shannon came to visit and I said to her, you know, because you've got really, um, you're, you have narcolepsy, but you also have very severe cataplexy. I asked Shannon if she wouldn't mind giving me a video example of how cataplexy impacts her day-to-day -day life. And that's what this video shows. Um, and before I started, I just want to, to, to say that this was Shannon's 28th birthday. So she's wearing a little tiara. Uh, she doesn't, it, you know, she doesn't normally do that, but it was her birthday. So it was a special occasion. And again, um, Dr. Murray mentioned that cataplexy or that loss of muscle tone is often triggered by emotionally charged um, scenarios such as intense emotion through laughter or fear. Um, and so this video is showing what happens to Shannon when her mom gives her a birthday cake. And so I'll start the video. And so mo Shannon's mom has just set this birthday cake down and look what happens to Shannon. She's quite excited by, by the fact she's done this. This is her uncle here. You notice her uncle has come to help her a little bit, put his arm around her. But I want you to notice Shannon. She told me what she was trying to do at this moment in this video was to blow two candles out on her birthday cake. You notice her brother moves some glasses away because she's having a hard time uh, keeping her head up. And you can see that, you know, she's really slouched over here. See, she re regains a bit of, of ability to move. And again, she's just trying so hard to blow the candles out on her birthday cake. And unfortunately, she loses the battle with cataplexy at this point. And now you can see her head is completely slumped forward. And Shannon told me that she just couldn't move at this point because she didn't have any muscle tone or muscle force to do what she wanted to, which was to hold her head up high, smile, thank her mom for her birthday cake, but instead, cataplexy got the best of her and she was left in this situation. So that's exactly this scenario really was a motivating force in my research is how is this happening to Shannon and to all of the people who experience cataplexy who have narcolepsy? And so, like I mentioned, it's my idea, and many of my clinical and, and, and scientific colleagues also uh, believe that it could be this REM sleep motor atonia that seems to get turned on inappropriately during wakefulness, and that that's what causes cataplexy in people with narcolepsy. And so that's what I'm going to walk you through today are two sort of themes in this area. 
One is what are actually the, the circuits or brain cells in, in, the, in the brain that generate healthy REM sleep? And is it possible that they actually contribute to cataplexy in narcolepsy? And I just want to point a couple of things out. Until, you know, recently, scientists and clinicians didn't actually have a clear understanding of where REM sleep and REM sleep atonia or this motor paralysis. How is the brain doing this? How is it turning it on? How does it turn it off? Nor did we understand whether the circuits or brain cells that cause REM sleep actually have any involvement in cataplexy. So I'm going to walk you through these two separate stories uh, that we've been looking at over the last, uh, I don't know, I think eight years. So now this is a slide. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Um, what you're actually looking at is all of these little bubbles and lines are just different parts of the brain and so and how they're connected to one another. So scientists have spent an enormous amount of time studying animals and trying to understand what parts of the brain generate REM sleep. And we've known for a very long time that there is lots of areas in the brain that do this. And so what you're actually looking at is the side view of a mouse's brain. So this would be towards the nose and this would be towards the tail. And here are all of the basic areas in the brain that we know have some role in changing REM sleep when we change the, the, the activity of cells in those areas. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this big bubble here that's labeled SLD. I don't really want you to know what SLD stands for, but I'll tell you it stands for the sublateral dorsal tegmental nucleus in the pons. And this area we've known for a very long time ha seems to have a, an important role in how REM sleep is controlled. Um, we know that cells in this area of the brain, and so just so you understand, this part of the brain is sort of at the back. It's sort of at the base of your neck. It's called the brainstem. We've known for a very long time that if you damage this area in animals or in people who have strokes or, or sort of a lesion in this part of the brain, that it changes the way REM sleep appears um, and it changes the normal appearance of REM sleep. So you may have much less of it, or you may have, um, you know, the loss of muscle tone may occur. Uh, so you move during REM sleep. So we know this is an important area. And from some of the work that, that we've done and some of my colleagues at Harvard and, and, and Stanford and, and Berkeley have done, is we've shown also that cells in this area are incredibly busy or active during REM sleep. And so because they're so busy or active during REM sleep, and if you damage those cells, it changes REM sleep, it sort of led us to think, hmm, maybe this is a really critical part of the brain for generating healthy REM sleep. So it's our hypothesis, although all of the things I've told you about so far are sort of, you know, they're associated with REM sleep, but, but there isn't any really clear evidence that this SLD region of the brain and the cells sitting in it actually generate REM sleep or this motor paralysis or atonia of REM sleep. So I'm going to walk you through a series of experiments that we did that really have nailed down now the fact that this SLD region is in fact a neural hub or hub or area that's important for generating REM sleep and more importantly for REM sleep atonia or paralysis. So here's some work that we did, and, and this might look like a lot of like, you know, gobbledygook to the non-science crowd out there, but we can use some pretty amazing genetic techniques in my lab so that we can actually label cells in the SLD with a marker that allows us to watch them in a mouse while the mouse is awake and then goes into non-REM or slow wave sleep and then into REM sleep. And why we do this is it allows us to ask the question, when are the cells in this part of the brain, the SLD here, in this little bubble, so this, this, these cluster of cells, when are they actually active? And what we found in mice is that every time a mouse entered into REM sleep, which is indicated here in these green bars, so two REM sleep periods, 
these cells became incredibly busy. And in between those uh, periods of REM sleep, they were really quiet. And importantly, what we did is we actually tried to find out what kind of cell, uh, kinds of cell that, that the, these are. There's many cells in the brain and they contain different chemicals. They release those chemicals and they're sort of the signatures of who those cells are. What we found is that these cells release a neurochemical called glutamate. And glutamate is incredibly powerful uh, neurochemical or neurotransmitter that signals other cells in the brain to become active. So what we found was in our, in our little mice that were in REM sleep, that glutamate cells specifically as part of the brain are extremely active during REM sleep. And so this led us to think, well, maybe glutamate cells in this part of the brain are important for REM sleep. There's been suggestions that that might be the case, but no one had ever really sort of nailed down the hard science evidence to suggest that. Again, this is another very sciencey looking slide, but it's, it's, it's a pretty um, simple message I'd like you to take home. So what we were able to do, having shown that these glutamate cells in this area of the brain called the SLD that we think might be involved in REM sleep, we're able to use some really cool uh, physics and genetic and engineering approaches to activate these cells on command. So what we uh, do is we actually take a very specific protein, we stick it in, genetically we add it in to our SLD cells that make glutamate, and then using a tiny little laser positioned above these cells, we can switch a laser on that turns those cells on or turns those cells off. But those cells remain healthy otherwise. So in a sense, what we're able to do is turn a very small group of genetically identified cells in a tiny little brain area in a happily sleeping and waking mouse and turn them on and turn them off and then ask a very simple question. If we manipulate glutamate cells in the SLD region of the brain, do they change REM sleep? And so I'm gonna walk you through not all of the work that we did, just some very specific parts. So remember that it, we think that cataplexy might be caused by this motor paralysis that happens during REM sleep. It might, cataplexy may be caused by these REM sleep cells. So we wanted to ask, do glutamate cells in this part of the brain, the SLD, do they actually even control REM sleep atonia or paralysis? So what we did is that we shut those cells off. Specifically during um, REM sleep in, uh, in a mouse. And what we found quite remarkably, as soon as we switched those cells off, the mice didn't have REM paralysis. They started to move around. So what you're looking at here is the muscle activity we call EMG or electromyogram. It's just a fancy way of saying muscle activity that we measure electrically and brainwave activity that Dr. Murray talked about. Um, and this is a mouse that's in REM sleep that has very little muscle tone. You can see this line is quite flat, except for the odd little twitch that naturally happens in REM sleep. Then we shut off these glutamate SLD cells using our fancy genetic approaches. And then we could increase muscle activity in these mice. And this is a very nice uh, um, summary of that data. So here's the normal level of muscle activity during REM sleep. So very little activity. And then we shut these glutamate cells off and you can see, boom, there's this big increase in muscle activity, suggesting that those cells normally cause muscle activity when they're normally doing their job. But as soon as we stop them from doing that by shutting them off with our genetic tools, uh, this level of muscle atonia is completely erased. And so now the mice can actually move around. It's a pretty amazing thing to watch. Um, they go from you know, being cuddled, huddled up in their little mouse nest, doing nothing. We shut those cells off, they stay in REM sleep and the mice start moving around. So that simple science observation is that 
glutamate cells in this area of the rest, uh, SLD actually control remetonia. And that was sort of the first uh, scientific uh, understanding that these specific cells in this specific area of the brain do that. So all I've uh, given you is a lot of talking and a few pictures to suggest that glutamate cells, a very a specific type of cell, sort of a signature cell um, in this area controls REM sleep paralysis or atonia. So then our question became, well, if they do actually cause REM sleep atonia, and we think REM sleep atonia is what causes cataplexy in narcolepsy, what happens if, again if we, you know, tweak those cells in mice that have narcolepsy and cataplexy? So before I tell you what we did and what we found, is there any clinical evidence from people with narcolepsy that this area of the brain, the SLD, is even involved in cataplexy? So my colleagues, uh, Giuseppe Platzi um, and uh, his co-workers in Italy, did this really beautiful study in kids who have narcolepsy and cataplexy. And what they did is to ask these kids, um, they, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting experiment. And I'm not sure how a parent would feel about it, but they took these kids and they put them in a brain scanner and then they made them laugh or smile or, um, you know, to have an episode of cataplexy. And they asked a real simple question. Is there any part of the brain that sort of lights up when cataplexy happens? And really interesting, this, this green dot right here in the brainstem kept lighting up every time one of these kids had an episode of cataplexy. Well, what is that green dot in our mice? It's actually the SLD. So remember, we found that when the SLD turns on in REM sleep, they have motor atonia, when we experimentally stop the SLD cells from turning on, they don't have motor atonia. So together, this clinical evidence and our basic science findings suggest the SLD is important in causing muscle atonia during REM sleep, and it's involved in the motor atonia during cataplexy based on these kids. So, you know, two pieces of evidence come together, basic science evidence in mice and clinical evidence in, in kids with uh, narcolepsy and cataplexy. They really beautifully mesh together to suggest that, yes, indeed, the SLD does seem to have a potential role in cataplexy. But like any imaging study, this is a, an association. So really, there's no clear evidence that the SLD causes cataplexy. Um, so that's where we come in as a basic scientist and ask this question in mice. So I had a, a very brilliant um, PhD student in my lab named Zoltan Torrentali, who I mentioned is now working at Jazz Pharmaceuticals, um, one of the pharma companies that has invested heavily in understanding narcolepsy and developing treatments for it. What Zoltan did was to say, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I manipulated these glutamate SLD cells in mice with narcolepsy? Could I make them have more narcolepsy if I activated them? And could I make them have less cataplexy if I silence them? And so that's, that's what I'm going to walk you through is some of Zoltan's really hard and quite in, ingenious work that he did. So using some more fancy genetic tools called chemogenetics, chemo standing for chemical, genetic standing for genetic, um, we're able to basically stick a very specific protein into our SLD cells and then use a chemical to turn that protein on and off and in accord, turn the cells on and off. So it's, it's really a nice strategy because we can manipulate the cells in a specific brain area just by letting mice have a specific chemical and then look at what happens to their behavior, specifically in this case, cataplexy. So just as a, a little bit of a background, 
Um, again, Dr. Murray mentioned that there are a group of brain cells that make a chemical called orexin or hypocretin, and those are the cells that appear to be lost or degenerate or not function properly in people with narcolepsy. So curiously, what we can do in mice is we can genetically remove those cells. And as soon as we do, our mice become, uh, develop all the symptoms of human narcolepsy. And one of the key symptoms is cataplexy. So our mice all of a sudden have these episodes of muscle loss, just like Shannon, who I showed you in the video, and they collapse to their cage floor and they have no motor uh, activity. So what Zoltan wanted to ask was, what happens if I manipulate these SLD cells, turn them on or off, in mice with cataplexy, would it impact their cataplexy? With the idea being that if these cells cause muscle paralysis, if I activate them, we should see more cataplexy in our mice. Whereas if we stop them from activating, we should see no cataplexy. So I hope that it's a lot of things to digest, but it's a fairly straightforward idea in principle Cells on, you get cataplexy. Cells off, you don't get cataplexy. And that's exactly what Zoltan found. And in science, I can promise you the one thing that you don't off, often see is what you expect to see. The brain is quite a mysterious place and you have an idea about how it works and then you test that idea and it doesn't often work out leading you to a new idea. But quite remarkably, what Zoltan found is that if you activate these SLD cells in mice with narcolepsy, it produces enormous amounts of cataplexy. So I'm. this is, again, a lot of information, but let's just look here for a second. So this is the muscle activity being recorded in a, in a, in a mouse that's running around its cage, and this is its brainwave activity that we're recording. And then you can see that all of a sudden there's this flat line, and that flat line is an electrophysiological um, example of cataplexy in a mouse. So what you're looking at, if I could show you a video, is a mouse running around, running around, lots of activity, and then all of a sudden the activity just goes completely flat. And if you could see a mouse, it just literally bloop, doesn't, it just collapses and it doesn't move. And just as quickly as it collapses, it returns and starts doing its little mouse activities like eating or drinking or running or grooming. And so Zoltan asked, like, what would happen if I change the activity of these SLD cells to these episodes of cataplexy? So I want to just now draw your attention here. And this is just looking at the behavior of a mouse over a three-hour window. The gray areas represent when the mouse is awake. The red little areas represent an episode of cataplexy and how long it lasted. So the mouse is awake for quite a long time. It has a short little episode of cataplexy that you see here. And then it can go into non-REM or REM and back to wakefulness. The mouse has another episode of cataplexy and so on. But what I really want you to focus on is there's one, two, three, four episodes of cataplexy in this one mouse over three hours. Then Zoltan activated these SLD cells. And I think you can see the dramatic difference between the same mouse in another three hour window. It has almost nothing but cataplexy. So all these red lines, the mouse is just basically falling down, falling down, falling down. And it's magnified enormously when we activate these SLD uh, cells that cause muscle atonia. So when we trigger them, it shuts the muscles off and these mice just basically almost stay in cataplexy uh, for a three hour window. And there is a clinical um, precedent for this called, um, it's, it's a, some individuals unfortunately have with narcolepsy have this persistent uh, very long lasting cataplexy. And so in a sense, that's what we did to our, our mice. But I can assure you, they're happy they eat and they drink after all of this uh, happens. And so here's overall data. And I'll just, let's just focus on these, these pie charts. So here's the normal, it's just another way of looking at the same thing um, over a three hour window. 
over the three hours that we looked, the mice are mostly awake. They have some non-REM or slow wave sleep. They have some REM sleep and they have a tiny little bit of cataplexy. So that's just the, the mouse with narcolepsy and its daily life. Then Zoltan activated these SLD cells and the mouse basically spends almost half its time in cataplexy. So a really profound effect. And from that observation, um, we found that you activate these SLC, SLD cells and it promotes cataplexy quite remarkably in our mice that have narcolepsy. So the obvious question is, well, what happens to cataplexy when we just stop those cells from being active? And quite remarkably, the exact opposite thing happens. Again, so here's here's a group, of, here's a whole uh, series of mice. It's the averages of how much time they're awake and asleep and in cataplexy. So these mice, I think there were eight in this study, um, had you know very small percentage of a three-hour period in cataplexy. And then look what happens when Zoltan shut those cells off. So they couldn't do their job of causing muscle paralysis. There is almost no cataplexy. And in this graph, you can't even see the red line anymore because there's so little of it. And this data here just is showing you, on average, in a three-hour period, our mice have about three to four episodes per three hours. And then when Zoltan silenced or switched off these cells, they have, a, they have nearly a threefold reduction in, in cataplexy. Again, suggesting that these cells that generate remetonia are critical in generating cataplexy. So what, what I've shown you so far um, is that these SLD cells are critical in normal REM paralysis um, and that they underlie the muscle paralysis that happens in cataplexy in mice with narcolepsy. So being a scientist, we're always very curious. And Zoltan's next question was, well, could I take a mouse that doesn't have cataplexy, activate these cells, and then would it have cataplexy? And so that's exactly what he found. Again, a really remarkable observation. So here's a, just a garden variety mouse. It doesn't have narcolepsy. It has all its hypocretin cells. It's running around, and then Zoltan switched off those SLD cells. And as soon as he did, or switched on, sorry, my, my apologies, the mouse experienced a, a, an episode of what we call cataplexy-like arrest. Um, because they're wild type, they're normal mice, we wanted to be careful and not call it cataplexy, so we called it cataplexy-like, uh, or a behavioral arrest. And these arrests strongly resemble cataplexy from the brain perspective and the muscle perspective in our mice with narcolepsy. And so when Zoltan activated these SLD cells, just like in a mouse with narcolepsy, he found that it basically spent three, almost the full three hours uh, in these periods of very prolonged, in some cases, 30 minutes of cataplexy, so a very profound effect. So the SLD region that we identified as being critical for generating muscle paralysis during REM sleep um, is critical in generating muscle paralysis uh, in, in, in healthy mice and causes them to have cataplexy. So with that being said, I, I haven't actually said it in a, a lot. In, so the one thing that if you can remember um, you know, this science talk is that this part of the brain known as the sub dorsal lateral tegmental region or the SLD sitting back here in the brain, it's really important for generating muscle paralysis and REM sleep. And it appears based on our basic science evidence that cells in this part of the brain that make a chemical called glutamate are also uh, critical for generating cataplexy and narcolepsy. So with that being said, I'm more than happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Peaver. There is one question here. Um, hi, Dr. Peaver. Thanks for your presentation and for acknowledging your grad students and researchers. I'll keep an eye out for their future work. My question is, do we have any understanding of 
what naturally activates SLD cells in people and or mice. Are SLD cells generated via the parts of the brain that experience strong emotions? Oh, so first of all, thank you for the question. And second, you should come and work with me because it, it shows great insight in that, that question because um, that's a whole other fleet of things that my, my lab has done. Um, and in this slide, again, this is just the side view of a mouse brain. So this way of looking at the brain um, and, and Dr. Murray mentioned that a lot that people with narcolepsy, those episodes of cataplexy are often triggered by strong positive emotions. So we've showed that this part of the brain um, or my colleagues have shown that this part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex kind of up in this area of the brain is in is heavily involved in interpreting emotional cues so whether they're positive or negative and that it relays that information to another part of the brain called the amygdala um, that again is involved in sensing fear and excitement um, and we've shown that these two areas of the brain actually connect into this area of the SLD and that when we manipulate either of these areas, we can increase cataplexy quite dramatically. So it, it lends evidence to suggest that the emotional cued elements of cataplexy all sort of feed in to this uh, REM area uh, in the brain that causes muscle paralysis. Thank you. Um, here's another question. What do you see in your future for cataplexy research? Oh, that's a great question. So one of the things that, that we're really interested in, so this is a great way to, for me to be able to say, like, why are you studying all these little things, you know, these little cells in the brain? So it, it's always been, you know, the, the understanding from both a clinical and science perspective that you need to sort of understand the way the engine or the brain works under normal conditions so that you can understand when things misfire um, how do you solve that problem? So now that we understand that, number one, we understand where in the brain cataplexy might be generated and what type of cells uh, that are in that part of the brain, we can start to ask questions like the previous uh, individual asked about, well, how does the rest of the brain connect to it? So that's one area that we're looking at. And the other is, do some of the, you know, the pharmaceutical uh, compounds that are effective in mitigating or reducing cataplexy, could they actually work at this part of the brain, this SLD, on the cells we've identified? And why that's important is, you know, we, you know, Dr. Murray talked and there was questions about side effects. So the goal really is if the more we understand, the more we can tailor future drug development to not only reduce cataplexy, but to reduce side effects. And we do that by really understanding much more um, with a much more focused lens, how the brain is, is how some drugs are changing brain activity to change the behavior that you, you don't want to experience. And in this case, cataplexy. So, you know, it's our understanding and we have uh, a recent collaboration with Jazz Pharmaceuticals to ask whether some of the compounds they're developing for reducing cataplexy and narcolepsy, could those compounds actually influence this part of the brain and the cells that are sitting in that part of the brain? Excellent, thank you. Another question, apologies if I missed this. Did the mice in these studies with narcolepsy and cataplexy have the condition spontaneously or was it induced somehow to allow study? Oh, that's another great question. Yes, yeah, so we actually did it in a variety of ways. So one way, um, and I wish I had a slide. I, I have this really cute slide where I have a mouse, like a picture of a of like 20 mouse faces and they all look identical. And why I've got that slide is how to measure emotions in a mouse is, is not like emotions in a person. It, the mouse's face is, like, we can't really interpret, is this a good or bad thing for a mouse? But what we do is, um, and what our colleagues and I have found, <clears throat> is that if you give two things to mice that we think they're excited by, if we were people, um, if you give a mouse chocolate, little chocolate chips, Hers Hers Hershey's Kisses, 
Um, they love Fruit Loops. As soon as you give it to them, they have a lot of cataplexy. Um, the other thing that you can really causes a mouse to have a lot more cataplexy is, is a running wheel. So if you or your kids ever had a hamster, it loves to run on its little wheel. Our mice love to do that as well. And so if you give a mouse a running wheel so they can run um, or you give them chocolate, they have way more cataplexy right after you give them those things. So we think that those are emotionally exciting cues um, for a mouse because it causes more cataplexy. And if you kind of remove or, or you know, stop these parts of the brain from working as well, they don't have as much cataplexy in response suggesting that these areas of the brain that sense emotion, if you will, um, when they're gone, the mouse doesn't have as much cataplexy. So in our studies, we used a sort of spontaneous cataplexy without those cues. And we looked at um, what we call emotionally cued cataplexy, where we gave them uh, a running wheel or little chocolate chips. Thank you. Next, utterly fascinating. Um, I was wondering how to silence SLD cells in humans, and it sounds like that is where the research is heading. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, that is um, exactly where a lot of this research is heading. Um, so you might have recalled I said we used a, a genetic approach called chemogenetics. A again, what that means is we can use a chemical to... Um, alter the activity of genetically tagged cells. This is actually starting um, to be investigated in humans, um, whereby you can actually use ultrasound to get a specific protein into the brain um, and then use a chemical to alter the cells of interest in the brain um, to change the behaviors that you want to change. So in this case, cataplexy. So this is certainly where this, re in, in an ideal world, this research is headed. But I think as you can imagine, it, it's, it has enormous clinical potential, but practically speaking, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do um, because you know there's a lot of invasive approaches, like in, in mouse experiments, you actually have to anesthetize the mouse and inject something into the SLD to deliver these uh, proteins that allow you to manipulate their activity. Um, so, you know, we're trying to look for ways around those invasive approaches. Um, but ultimately, that's the pipe dream here, that there's enormous potential clinical relevance, not to just the findings, um, but to the approaches that we use to get to those findings. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Peaver. Are there any therapeutic treatments currently in or heading to clinical trial based on your research? Um, well, the answer is no. Um, you know, this research um, was, only came out, I, I can't remember, in 2019. And so I, I mentioned that I, we've been working with um, a couple of pharmaceutical companies to ask if their compounds um, might, you know, work in this area. But the research is so preliminary at, at this point in time, I would happily share it with you if I, I knew the outcomes of whether some uh, new, uh, un, un, um, not clinically used uh, compounds at the moment, because they're still in trials, um, if they might actually work by manipulating this part of the brain. Um, but that's what, again, what we're, you know, that's what this work is really about. So, you know, we're funded by the Canadian government and a variety of other agencies um, to sort of get to those answers. And, and I know people who have a condition, um, you know, like narcolepsy and cataplexy, you want answers fast. And, and it's heartbreaking for me as a scientist to say this work takes, you know, years and years and years to get to it, and it's really slow. And it, if we could make it go faster, we would, but it's just the nature of how, you know, the brain is beautiful, but it's ugly, it's complicated. And that complexity really ha slows us down and, and trying to develop ways to, to test various ideas um, is slow to develop. And there's really a rich scientific community who comes together with technical ideas and, and experimental ideas and clinical ideas. And we all work together 
to try and solve some of the, the problems that we want to solve so that patients, for example, with, with narcolepsy, um, don't experience some of the unfortunate side effects of, of the condition. Great. Thank you, Dr. Peaver. How can the narcolepsy community support your research? Um, well, I, I think you're already doing it by being here and, um, and wake up narcolepsy, you know, has done and, and Monica and her family have done an amazing job at raising funds and the funds that they've raised through their tireless effort, um, are used to not only support these type of events, but to support people like myself. And I mean, it, and, and I apologize uh, for not acknowledging this, but this research was um, funded um, in part by Wake Up Narcolepsy and they provide research money so that I can, you know, do these experiments and, and pay the graduate students to do those experiments. So that's the, contributing to, to Wake Up Narcolepsy is an excellent way to make um, this type of research move forward. And um, Wake Up Narcolepsy is really an amazing group of people who have, they're doing just that. And uh, that's how it all works.